This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. Hey everyone, Jeremy here. And guys, I'm very excited for the conversation that we're going to have today because for many years, we've heard the name George Soros. It has to deal with countries, it has to deal with elections, it has to deal with lots of different things out there. Um, We've heard it recently with um, Soros DAs across the country. And I wanted to find out more about this. And there's somebody I've followed for quite a long time, even since the days of Glenn Beck being back on Fox. He is the best-selling author of a book called The Shadow Party, how George Soros, Hillary Clinton, and 60s radicals seized control of the Democratic Party. His name is Richard Poe. Richard, thank you for hanging out with me today, sir. Well, thanks, Jeremy. And... um I just wanted to say that I co-wrote The Shadow Party with sure. um, with my colleague and my former boss, uh, David Horowitz. So it's by both of us. Uh, just, just wanted to mention that. Now, um, the thing about Soros, as we all know, is uh, people call him Voldemort, he who shall not be named. Uh, there's a, there's been a tremendous kind of psyop conducted to make people feel afraid to talk about Soros or report on him, lest they be accused of anti-Semitism or all kinds of other things. In fact, um, as as you know, while we were setting up for this interview, I, I got an email saying that somebody in Germany had reported one of my Soros posts. I, I had the same thing happen this morning. It was Elon really? Musk had put out a tweet about um, Alexander Soros running a lot of the operations. And I was like, oh, it makes sense. George is like a billion years old. Um, mm-hmm. And I got reported for saying he was a billion years old <laughs> by the <laughs> German government. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't even say anything as, as irreverent as that. I just said he's a British asset, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. After 30 years of research, I've drawn this conclusion. And that I believe that his campaign of um, funding quote unquote liberal DAs um, is part of a British psychological operation, a, a regime change operation, which is probably intended to encourage national divorce. Um, mm-hmm. The breakup of our country uh, having been a, a British um, foreign policy priority for 240 years since the revolution. Now, that probably sounds kind of, you know, kind of edgy, you know, if not crazy to a lot of people (laughs) out there. Well, it's it's Uh, different than what we've heard about Soros, right? Like we we just hear about he's this big money guy spending money, all these different things, you know, open society and whatnot. This is the first I've heard. And that's why I wanted to have you on. This is the first I've heard somebody talk about British asset. Well, well, thank you. And, and I'm not the first person who's, who said it. There have been a lot of, uh, let's say, alternative writers out there who've, who've written on this subject. It's, it's really not, it's no secret. It's like so many other things with Soros. It's right there in your face, and it's pretty obvious. Um, but for someone like me coming out of a mainstream uh, journalistic background, um, which I used to be, um, you know, you don't want to go anywhere near anything so different from what other people are saying. It's not mm-hmm. that it's more uh, innately implausible or in any way um, questionable, because as I said, it's it's pretty easy to to prove and to establish these things. But when you're in mainstream journalism, what you're mainly focused on, if you want to keep your job, is trying as much as possible to say exactly the same thing everybody else is saying. Mm -hmm. And I've never been that kind of person by nature. I've always been kind of contrarian. Um, But when I started writing about Soros, I I had uh, I was still I still considered myself in the mainstream world. I was writing a book called How to Ro- Profit from the Coming Russian Boom. 
And uh, this was in the early 90s, and I was writing this book for McGraw-Hill, which is about as mainstream as you can get. Mm-hmm. And at that time, in fact, I I wrote about Soros completely positively. I wrote uh, very positive things about him and his operations in Russia in my book. And that was because... Um, while I wasn't unaware of certain controversies around him, at the time, I was still very much uh, imbued or indoctrinated, if you will, in the Cold War doctrine. And I was feeling the the excitement of those times, which I guess you're probably too young to remember, but the, the time, those times in the early 90s when communism was coming down, the Berlin Wall had come down, um, all of a sudden seemingly without warning or, or reason, the, the whole Warsaw Pact, all these Eastern Europe, European countries and the USSR itself were all decommunizing. It, it was a very exhilarating time for people like me, people of my age group who'd grown up hiding under the desk, you know, waiting for the nuclear attack to come. Uh, over the North Pole from Russia, very mm-hmm. heady time. And so we felt that, you know, Soros was part of the team. You know, Soros was was one of the people who was there tr- helping to make this happen, helping to helping the Russians to adjust and adapt to a free market system. And we all kind of expected that Russia would become a normal Western country and it was all going to be great. So this was all reflected in my book, How to Profit from the Coming Russian Boom, back in 1993. That was the first thing that I ever wrote about George Soros, and it was totally positive. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward to 2004, I got a phone call from my then editor, Chris Ruddy at Newsmax. And uh, I I was one of the first columnists at Newsmax. They started it in 1998. I started in 1999. And uh, Chris called me up and he said, how would you like to do a cover story for Newsmax magazine on the subject of George Soros? And um, he clearly gave me to understand this was to be an expose, you know, uh, exposing all these controversial things about him. And at that time, Soros had become quite controversial because he had suddenly, uh, for the first time, I think, started speaking out on American politics very publicly and very in very inflammatory ways, saying he was going to do, quote-unquote, a regime change against uh, President Bush and saying that what he had done in other countries he was now going to do in the United States. And so for those of us who are familiar with Soros' color revolutions that he had done uh, in Eastern Europe and and other places, actually, uh, not just Eastern Europe, Africa, all over the world he's done these things. But most famously in Eastern Europe, he was very instrumental in bringing down many communist regimes. And that was... Well, he was one of the guys behind Maidan, right? Um, I believe so. Yes. I, I mean, I hesitated because I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak. Sure. He, he was certainly, well, I guess just so people have an idea of like what color revolution season would be involved in, I guess it would just well, be if, if we he, could mention some of those quickly. He was certainly involved in the first Ukrainian color revolution, which was called the orange revolution. That's right. That's an admitted fact. I, I just don't have it top of mind if he ever admitted to being involved in in the next one, he may have, but uh, certainly the well, first. I, I've done a lot of research on that one, and it seems like he may have, but I don't. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But and anyway, the the Orange Revolution, yeah. Okay, well, I'm I'm sure you're right. It's just it's just not top of mind. Sure. Um, he he hasn't been involved. It would be odd if he wasn't involved in that one because he, he's basically been involved in all of those Eastern European color revolutions, including the one in Georgia in 2003 and uh, the Ukrainian one in 2004 Mm -hmm. and um, uh, certainly Yugoslavia in 2000 and uh, and on and on. He's he's basically always involved whenever 
the um, color revolution uh, infrastructure goes into place, and it's it's really an Anglo-American infrastructure. Um, it involves both U.S. NGOs and U.K. NGOs. The U.K. is very much involved in these these operations, and that I believe is the reason that Soros got involved in them in the first place, because. Mm-hmm. It is it is now a um, a linchpin of my uh, position on Soros that that he works for the British. Um, it, it's it's really pretty obvious, and it shouldn't be so surprising. He he was educated in England. Uh, he came there as a refugee. I think he was seventeen years old. He arrived uh, as a refugee from from communist Hungary just after World War II. He lived there for 10 years in England. He graduated from the London School of Economics. He was indoctrinated in British liberal imperialism by one of its greatest spokesmen, the philosopher Karl Popper. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize that Karl Popper's famous book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, is literally and absolutely a philosophical defense of British liberal imperialism. It is explicitly a defense of that system of global governance, let's call it. Mm -hmm. And what that means, British liberal imperialism, this was a belief that was pushed, especially starting in the late 19th century, that the purpose of the British Empire was no longer just to loot and plunder. Uh, Well, of course, they never admitted it was just that. But in the late 19th century, it became very fashionable and it became a sort of propaganda message of the British imperial state that the purpose of the empire was actually to spread liberalism throughout the world, Mm -hmm. that it, it was to... It was to bring democracy and freedom and uh, peace and f- uh, free trade, of course, and all these enlightened things that still to this day we in the West claim we're bringing to the benighted world uh, beyond our borders. So this was a British idea that was um, put forth and, and popularized by the British Fabians in the mm-hmm. 19th, early 20th century, and then it was uh, it was set forth in philosophical terms by Karl Popper in this book in 1945. It was called The Open Society and Its Enemies. And what Karl Popper actually said in that book is that we live in a world where most people exist in tribal, traditional societies— And he said that's bad. He called these closed societies. So Mm. if you think of Dances with Wolves, if you're old enough to remember that film, um, you basically had the Kevin Costner character, a Union cavalryman, have an encounter with the Lakota Sioux, a tribal people, and decide to go native, quote-unquote, and join them because he decided he would rather be a tribesman in this tribe. He decided he would be a freer and happier man joining this tribe and fighting against his own people, the, the, the Union Army. And in the philosophy of Karl Popper, it's just the opposite. Karl, Karl Popper would have said that those Lakota Sioux people lived in a closed society, that they were oppressed by the fact that their world was limited to ancient stories and traditions of their ancestors and they were stuck in a rut having to live and relive this traditional uh, belief system over and over again through the generations. What Karl Popper wanted for people is to live in what he called an open society, which means a modern society which would, excuse me, there's a popping sound that I have to get rid of. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. So Popper said 
that we need to be open, which which is the same thing as saying uh, modern. Rather mm-hmm. than being traditional and tribal, we need to be modern and rootless, if you will, uh, because these traditions suppo- supposedly hold us back. The very idea of being per- uh, perceived or perceiving ourselves as a tribe or an ethnicity, Copper said, Popper said, was... Uh, limiting us and and stunting to our souls and to our development and keeping us from becoming modern, enlightened, and truly free people. So how do you how do you go from being these supposedly closed people? Again, let's use the dances with wolves analogy. How do you mm-hmm. go from being a closed society like the Lakota Sioux in Dances with Wolves? to being an, a modern, open, and supposedly free society like uh, Lieutenant Dunbar's Union Cavalry in Dances with Wolves. Well, Karl Popper said there's only one way to accomplish it. The tribal society must be conquered by an empire. He literally mm. said that imperialism is the only way to do it, that a superior, modern, m- uh, multi-ethnic Empire, such as the British Empire, in, in which, of which he was a citizen, uh, must go in, conquer these tribal societies, and detribalize them. Teach them how to be modern instead of tribal. So this is the core of Karl Popper's open society. This is the core of British liberal imperialism, which in fact the not just Popper, but the entire London School of Economics was based on it. The the London School of Economics, which Soros attended and from which he graduated, was founded by Fabians. And it was founded to propagate this very ideology of liberal British imperialism, that it was the role of the empire to go out and conquer the world in order to enlighten people and turn them from being tribal people into being a multi-ethnic, cosmopolitan, modern, free people mm-hmm. hooked into the the modern Western system. So Soros learned this in school from Karl Popper, who was his teacher, but he went beyond that, and he actually devoted his entire life to the teachings of Karl Popper, He's, he started a charity called the Open Society Institute, which was named mm-hmm. in honor of Karl Popper. So this is one of the many reasons why I say it's obvious that Soros is a British asset, because I wrote about this in, uh, in an article, I think last year, it was called uh, How the British Invented George Soros. And one of the issues I explored was the British system of of projecting soft power. The, the, the British call themselves the greatest soft power in the world, meaning that they are the, uh, the best at spreading their influence through influence networks and, and, and guiding and basically manipulating other countries through these networks of influential people which they control. And uh, I quoted from British government documents explaining how this program works. Basically, if you attended a a British university, they they encourage foreign students to go to these universities for this very specific purpose. They have a program run by the British Foreign Office, which expressly calls for recruiting foreign students to come to British universities so they can be indoctrinated in the British ideology, which is liberal imperialism. Mm-hmm. And and then once they are so indoctrinated and once they are acclimatized and assimilated and, and in a sense given some kind of stake in British society, at the very least some kind of uh, sympathy toward British society, which anyone would get having gra- gone to, a, to college there. Sure. Uh, the British Foreign Office says in their own documents that they then 
have a highly organized system for keeping track of these graduates as they return to their home countries, for encouraging them to uh, go to events and take part in all kinds of activities, to network with other graduates of UK universities for the express and explicit purpose Again, according to these UK government documents, for the express purpose of helping the British Foreign Office to influence their home countries to uh, go along with British policy. Now, this is just one of several reasons why I say Soros is a British asset. It's because as a graduate of the London School of Economics, he is part of this program of soft power. He is expressly and explicitly part of it. But even more than that, he, he, he has shown by his actions and by the entire course of his career and by starting a charity named after his professor at the London School of Economics and dedicated to the implementation of the Fabian a doctrine of liberal British imperialism. He has literally devoted his entire life to this. So not only was he a target for this kind of soft power recruitment, but he showed by his actions that he was successfully recruited, that he remained till till he's now in his 90s. What is he, 92, something like that? I don't know. Uh, According to, to, to Twitter, he's not a billion is what I learned today. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, let, let me let me let me ask you this then, Richard. Like, so if, if I, I can if that totally makes sense to me because I didn't realize the, the Karl Popper connection with open society, you know, that is and that, that was kind of the first thing that came to mind when you mentioned it. But I'm curious for for people listening, like then then how does he do it in these different countries? You know, like, um, you know, I know you referenced this in your book, The Shadow Government that you, that you co-authored. But how, how does Soros do this then in these different countries? And, and, and what is he doing in America currently? Well, actually, the book is called The Shadow Party. Shadow um, Party, sorry. Just just to <laughs> make sure that's... Speaking that's, quickly here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's called The Shadow Party. Now, um, what we described in that book was Soros having made a career of overthrowing governments through these so-called color revolutions, announced in 2003 that what he had done in other countries, and he named several countries where he had done color revolutions, he was now going to do in the United States. He announced it publicly. And there was no question what he meant, that he was going to use all the same tactics that he'd used in places like Yugoslavia, and he was going to use them here. And I think after the extraordinary events of the year 2020, I think we all can see very clearly what he meant by that. So we described in the shadow party the history of how he would organize these these color revolutions. And Basically, what it involved, his role in it was twofold. It was it was primarily f helping to fund them in cooperation with uh, a whole uh, NGO infrastructure, which which is controlled uh, partly by the U.S. government, partly by the British government, uh, and there are even I think there are French NGOs and even German ones, and from some other countries that have been set up, but. This system of color revolutions is really um, – a lot of people now are finally catching on that it's not just George Soros doing it. Uh, it's that it, it is really um, – it's NATO. It's it's the Western governments themselves. It's, it's this entity that we used to call the free world at a governmental level that's doing it. And Soros is merely plugged into that. Now, we didn't delve into that aspect of it too much in uh, in the shadow party, but um, we mo focused mainly on Soros and his role. But basically, Soros has been, um, he's been kind of the public face of all of these uh, essentially covert operations. And 
this goes to the question of what I call the Soros PSYOP, because what what I discovered about Soros, what I came to understand about him, is that he's a front, he, that that he is much more of a kind of celebrity figure who's put in front of the cameras to be the sort of chosen bad guy for everybody to point at and hate and blame. Yeah, he's uh, like the Emmanuel Goldstein type of character. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, yeah. A- and... This comes as a surprise to a lot of people, but I I am quite sure, I'm absolutely sure now uh, that it's true, and that goes for his color revolutions as well. Yes, he and his Open Society Institute, or now it's called the Open Society Foundations, yes, they put money into these color revolutions, they took part in them in all kinds of ways, but what Soros does is he's the guy who gets up and cl- takes credit for it and says, I did it in front of the cameras. Mm. And I believe the reason he was chosen for that is, well, we see it right in front of us every day. If you go on Twitter right now, there's a lot of talk about Soros right now as we speak. Elon Musk is talking about him. Candace well, even, Owen, even um, Ron DeSantis in his, in his speeches, like I think he just keeps saying the word... Soros DAs because it's popular at the moment, right? Right, like it's, right. It, it's just become very charged in that way. Right, and, and that's you know that's a perfectly legitimate thing to say. If they, the establishment, the powers that be, if they want to put forth Soros and say it's all his doing, then it, sure, it's a useful shorthand for us to go along with that. But I'm trying to probe deeper into it now, especially with my latest series of articles, which you can find on Substack. And in this article that I referenced before, uh, how the British invented George Soros, I, I basically showed that Soros became a celebrity in the early 90s. The, the thing that launched him, that launched his career as, as a media figure was when he supposedly, quote unquote, broke the Bank of England. So suppose, that was the question I was going to ask is like, is like, how is he, I guess, a, a front for the British, yet he's the quote unquote guy that broke the Bank of England? Yes, exactly. And see what happened. I think it was uh, 1992 when this when he did this, supposedly Soros single handedly or almost single handedly uh, shorted the British pound, uh, devalued the British pound by, I think, 20 uh, percent dumping British pounds while the the, the uh, Bank of England was supposedly desperately trying to buy them up. But here's the thing. The reality of the situation is that many, many financial institutions, much bigger than George Soros, were involved in that operation, including some of the biggest uh, banks, pension funds, and other financial institutions in the world took part in that. But more importantly, the whole thing appears to have been orchestrated by s- certain factions of the British establishment themselves. And the reason they did it, as I think I pretty well established in that article, the reason they did it, as they admitted themselves somewhat later, is that they 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 wanted to devalue the British pound in order to prevent the pound from being converted to the euro, because at that time they were just get setting up the eurozone and they were making preparations to convert uh, other European currencies to the euro and the pound was supposed to be converted. But because of that devaluation supposedly caused by Soros, they were unable to qualify. They were kicked out of the that's European really exchange rate mechanism. Yes, yes. Because that's extremely, it was extremely successful because the, the pound stayed, stayed pretty darn strong even against the, the US dollar. I, I remember being, um, I studied in the UK in 2009 and I remember like it was like 1.7 to a dollar, like I couldn't buy anything. So it, 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 it apparently worked. Uh, yes, apparently it did. And here, the, the, here's, here's the other thing that's kind of strange about it. Um, there was a guy named Lord William Rees Mogg, mm-hmm. who was a very prominent 
a British journalist. Uh, I have named him the man who created George Soros. And I think, I think that title is appropriate. Rees Mogg was the editor in chief of the Times of London for 14 years. He became a, a vice chairman of the BBC after that, continued writing as a columnist for the Times. Rees Mogg took it upon himself to become the leading promoter of George Soros, and his, his biggest champion and promoter in the British press, so that when Soros supposedly broke the Bank of England, here's how it happened. At first, when it first happened, nobody knew who did it, or supposedly nobody knew who did it, and that's to be expected because uh, international currency speculators don't normally go around boasting about their deeds. They try to hide their their activities as best they can um, because they don't want to be investigated. They don't want to be criminally prosecuted, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, breaking mm -hmm. a national currency is a pretty, pretty big deal. It gets a lot of people officially angry at you. Right. So uh, for some time, and I think maybe for weeks, nobody actually knew who broke the Bank of England, quote-unquote, until all of a sudden George Soros himself suddenly popped up and announced, I did it. He confessed. Wow. And he confessed through a British newspaper, which I think was the Daily Mail. Uh, I, I think, I hope I got that right. They suddenly ran a, a cover story, a big headline, and a picture of George Soros sipping champagne or wine, and the headline said something like, Soros says, I did it. And supposedly this story was based upon leaked documents from Soros's quantum fund, which was then domiciled in the Netherlands Antilles, which is a secrecy jurisdiction. And supposedly somebody leaked a quarterly report from the quantum fund to the British press showing that that uh, Soros had supposedly been the man who broke the Bank of England. So on several levels, this is very strange because these secrecy jurisdictions are set up for a reason. And if any officer of the quantum fund had leaked such documents to the press, um, I, I wonder what would have happened to him. I, 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 it, I think under the laws of the Dutch Antilles, that may be uh, a serious criminal offense. I, I'm not sure, but, sure. you know, they have very strong secrecy laws. At, at, at the very least, there would have been some repercussions. You'd think the culprit would have been found and revealed, and that would be part of the story. But somehow it was supposedly leaked. Soros supposedly said, oh, I'm shocked, shocked that somebody leaked this, and how how could this information get out? But then... If he was so shocked and so dismayed, why did he then go straight to the Times of London and, and grant an interview to them and confess the whole thing? He not only confessed everything, but he exaggerated, he boasted, he, he actually told the Times that I and my quantum fund, more than any other institution in the world, probably are mainly responsible for breaking the Bank of England. That's what he told them. And so the Times came out with a headline calling Soros the man who broke the Bank of England. And that's, mm. he's worn that name ever since. Now, Lord William Rees Mogg, who was then a columnist for the Times, started writing all of these columns praising Soros, thanking him, saying he had done a wonderful thing. He had saved Britain from the euro that he had saved the British currency from the euro, and that, thank God, we have George Soros to look out for our British interests instead of, you know, these wow. idiots in the government. And with every column, he, he, he grew more rhapsodic in his praise of Soros, saying, you know, that there should be a statue of him erected outside the, the British treasury, he should get a knighthood, um, he, 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 all these things. And so this is where Rees-Mogg sort of outed himself, revealed himself, 
as the, in effect the the sponsor or the public sponsor or or uh, the public promoter of George Soros. So he not only promoted him as the savior of Britain, he not only took it upon himself to explain to the British people that, oh no, this wasn't a bad thing, the breaking of the Bank of England, it was a good thing. rees not only took on that role of explaining to the British people that Soros was really their hero, but he then went further and said, well, what sort of man could do such an amazing thing to break the Bank of England single-handedly. He must be the greatest financial genius in the world. We should watch this man closely because a man like that, you know, watch his moves and imitate them. Yeah. And this is where we get the legend of Soros, the financial genius. Now, I don't know if Soros is a genius or not. He, he could be. Um, I have to say from his books and articles that I have read, I, I don't see any signs of genius. They they seem a little dull to me, uh, quite frankly, with, with all apologies to Mr. Soros. Uh, I don't say that to be insulting, but they're, they seem a little, little turgid, a little slow-witted, um, a little derivative and unimaginative. That's my personal pres- impression. And I wouldn't say that just because I disagree with him on on other subjects. I I give people their due, but I I just don't see signs of of genius in it. Certainly not in his writings. Mm-hmm. Um, now, yes, he's he's a multi billionaire. So people could say, "Well, Richard, you're just jealous." You know, <laughs> he's a billionaire and you're not. Sure, I'd love to be a billionaire, but when you're at the level of Mr. Soros, and you're you're working closely with high level people in governments like Soros. You don't have to be a genius to make lots and lots of money. Look at Nancy Pelosi. At, yeah. at that level, the most brilliant investor that ever lived, Nancy Pelosi. Right. You know, at that level, genius is not required for making money. In fact, it's not done that way. You just have to know about the legislation before it passes and then make the right moves. Yeah, you just have to have, you know, your friends and colleagues in the right places clue you in and you'll know what to do. Yeah. Now, I'm, again, I I, I don't say that to offend Mr. Soros. It's quite possible that maybe he's somehow unique in in the annals of, of elite establishment figures. Uh, maybe he doesn't take advantage of of this kind of inside information. Maybe he really, out of pride or some other peculiar personality quirk, maybe he really does do all his own homework and really did make all his money through pure genius. Mm-hmm. But I just it just doesn't look that way to me. It, the way it looks to me is f- that the British establishment and certain high level financiers in the city of London. Uh, latched on to Soros. They found him to be a useful figure to play a certain role in the public eye. And that role was to be their own controlled financial genius whom they could put before the press, uh, have him write columns in the Financial Times and have him make financial prognostications. So basically he was set up as a person who people would listen to. And if he made financial investment tips or suggestions that people would follow it. And so he was set up as a kind of propaganda operation. And Mm -hmm. this is what I argued in my article, how the British invented George Soros. And this is what I meant by it. They Mm -hmm. invented him in the sense that they made him something much, much bigger than he was, the man who broke the Bank of England, the greatest financial genius in the world. Both of which things, I I just don't think there's any evidence to show that he is either one. This episode is sponsored by MyPillow, um, my favorite product that I take with me absolutely everywhere. I just spent a week up in Lake Placid, New York on a ski vacation. And uh, I actually have an extra my pillow we leave up at the cabin. Really exciting, and uh, keeps me from having neck trouble when I travel. So if you have that, and uh, you want to prevent that, 
You can use my promo code, which is CYOL, and get up to 66% off select products at MyPillow.com. Up to 66% off select products. Go out and grab my favorite product, which is the MyPillow Classic. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Also, this week, I am on Dr. Jason Dean's uh, new detox, as it's the full moon is coming up on the 6th of January, which is very, very soon. And uh, we are doing our detox of different parasites that are in our body. So, if you guys want to join me on the parasite cleanse and uh, cleanse your body from those creepy little creatures that are crawling in there and causing a lot of conditions you're dealing with... <clears throat> You can head over to bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L. Um, you get a discount over there as well. I believe it's about 20% if you use my promo code. So that is bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L. Well, I guess the question is then, why? Is it just a, like a smoke screen so that you're, you're watching you know, this while something else is happening? Is, is that kind of the idea then? Well, it's part of that. It's, it's partly to put out propaganda messages. Um, for example, one of the first things he did once he, he had been established as the man who broke the Bank of England, uh, he started buying gold and Lord rees Mogg started directing people's attention to this and saying, well, look, he's buying up gold, and so maybe we should pay attention to this because he's a genius. And what was happening is that, um, see, see, I should explain that Reese Mogg was a business partner and a very close personal friend with Lord Jacob Rothschild. Mm -hmm. um, he And he was also, I think, a partner in Lord Rothschild's investment vehicle, which was called um, the St. James Place Capital Group. And another partner in that, I believe, was Sir James Goldsmith. And there were a couple of others, but it was a very tight group of men who were partners in the St. James Place Capital Group. And Rees Mogg was one of these partners. I think he was a partner. He was somehow affiliated with it. But Rees Mogg, I should also mention, was a very close personal friend of the, the British royal family as mm -hmm. well. So he was, I kind of uh, call him a bridge between two worlds. Uh, he, was a, he was a bridge between the sort of money-grubbing world of the city of London you know, all these uh, bankers and stockbrokers and, and the blue blood world. Uh, of the British royal family and the British nobility uh, of and and the, the land-holding aristocracy of which he was a part. He himself came from an ancient land-owning aristocratic family. And I call him a bridge between worlds because he mm -hmm. was perfectly comfortable in both of those worlds. So to answer your question, what was the purpose of George Soros? It looks to me as if his purpose, his primary purpose was to be a front for this particular group of men, Rees Mogg, his friends in the city of London, his business partners in the city of London, and in fact, the British royal family itself, um, which is extremely wealthy, uh, I, I would argue far more wealthy than we're led to believe. Um, they, they release figures on the net worth of the royal family, which are ridiculously uh, uh, um, understated. Mm -hmm. When you consider that this this royal family were ground floor investors on the earliest joint stock uh, companies th from 500 years ago that, that began the, the age of exploration, they were literally ground floor investors in the entire conquest, exploration, and development of planet Earth. Yeah. And so imagine how wealthy they must be. But we'll never know... Because England has this elaborate system of what they call secrecy jurisdictions set up in places like uh, the Bahamas and Bermuda and the Isle of Jersey and what have you. We will never know how much money the royals have or, frankly, that any wealthy person has. All these lists that you see in Forbes and Fortune, it's all just guesswork. Mm -hmm. And it consistently underestimates 
because there is no way to find out what money is held in these offshore banking havens, these secrecy jurisdictions, as right. the British call them. So anyway, the the you have to understand that uh, you know people people even people who are sympathetic to my present research about about the hidden power of Britain, I, I call it. They always say, well, it's not really the British, it's the city of London. You know, it's all those grubby bankers in the city of London. It's not the nice Anglo-Saxon people of Britain. You, you get this a lot. And I try to explain to people that, that the British aristocracy, or at least certain families, are extremely wealthy and extremely active in global finance, and the British royal family especially they get the lion's share. That's why they're the royals. It's their prerogative, and it always was their prerogative to to take the lion's share from these global trade monopolies that they've been setting up for literally 500 years. So it was leaked by Soros's biographer, one of his biographers, that the Queen of England, the late uh, Elizabeth II, was in fact one of his investors in the quantum fund. And there's no way to prove this. Uh, you can't you can't prove anything about where the royals invest their money. But it was deliberately leaked in Soros's authorized autobiography, mm. um, his first one. And I can't remember the name of the author. I'm sorry, but it's a very famous book. I, I think it's called uh, something Messiah, Soros the Messiah, something like that. Uh, the, oh, d something of the messianic billionaire it has the word mess. Uh, the mess life and times of the messianic billionaire. Yeah, that's uh, by one. Michael Kaufman. Got it. Got it. In that book, in that book, there's a leak that supposedly Queen Elizabeth II is an, is a, a major investor in the quantum fund, and you often get this. Uh, I found in the British um, press, the the British media ecosystem, because. There is no real mechanism for for um, transparency of royal investments, but some sometimes they leak what they're investing in. And I think they probably do it to encourage others to invest. So this sure. was leaked in that book uh, without a, a source, with, you know, without a real source that you could track down. But it was leaked. So anyway, Soros is. He's basically a guy who seems to have been appointed by Lord Will William Rees-Mogg, the guy I describe as the bridge between worlds. And he was appointed as the spokesman, as the public spokesman for this, mm -hmm. for these two worlds, because I believe that his quantum fund was also a bridge between worlds. It was a place where City of London bankers and people like that could mingle their funds with the royal family and people like that. And they could do it in the Netherlands Antilles where there's total lack of transparency and nobody has any idea what they're all up to down there. And Soros was part of the mechanism of the security mechanism in a way because these financial operations, these are part of the things that he talks about as as the talking head. Let's call him the talking head of the British establishment. And a lot of his talking was about financial issues and investment tips and where you should put your money or where you shouldn't put your money. But a lot of it had to do with politics, which governments were bad, which governments should be overthrown. And historically, as sure as Mr. Soros said some government should be overthrown, it would be overthrown in a color revolution. So the impression given was that Soros himself was some kind of all-powerful James Bond villain who was making all this happen. But once you realize that he had the whole British establishment behind him, from the royal family uh, down through the, the, the city of London financiers uh, and anyone else who might invest in the quantum fund or other of Soros's investment vehicles, and once you realize that those investment vehicles are the same vehicles that would be used by British intelligence uh, for its various kinds of operations around the world, be they economic warfare operations, be they color revolutions, 
uh, or any other kind of um, destabilization or psychological operation that would require moving large quantities of money. Soros was your man. Mm -hmm. And and I'll give you another example of that. Rees Mogg also in the Times of London at one point again in the early 90s, uh, and I've tweeted about this on Twitter, uh, he, he started calling for investments to be put into China. He was saying China will be the greatest superpower in the world, greatly surpassing the United States, and we should all put our money into China now. And we should uh, a big a good way to do this is through secrecy jurisdictions, offshore accounts of the sort that George Soros runs. He named Soros specifically as the type of person and the quantum fund specifically as the type of outfit that you might want to consider if you want to put a whole lot of money into China. And he said that, as Lord Rees Mogg said, that now some people might think that it's a little risky to put money in a communist country like China. But let me tell you, the Chinese are absolutely dependent on this offshore money, by which he meant dark money. Mm -hmm. And he said they're absolutely dependent on it. And if you are their benefactor and if you are giving them this money, they will take care of you. He said if you're involved in this global operation, which Rees Mogg himself was unashamedly promoting and spearheading through the Times of London to finance China and literally to build up China into a power more powerful than the United States – Rees Mogg basically promised his readers that if you do this, if you play ball with China, China will play ball with you. And and he specifically pointed to George Soros and his quantum fund as the type of person and the type of operation you might want to look at if you're thinking of sinking money into China. So this is something to think about as we mm-hmm. now read in the news we're supposedly on the brink of war with China and how did China become so powerful so quickly well you can see that Lord Rees Mogg and his friends in the city of London were openly exhorting the finan- the global financial community to bring this about uh, well that, that's one thing I want to I want to talk about for a second too and I'm glad you mentioned China as well because you, you we look at a lot of what's happened you know in 2020 and what we've experienced since and things like that. But you can look at parts of that and it seems like like a Maoist cultural revolution, but you look at other parts of it and it could be perceived as a, as a color revolution. And the thing I struggle with, Richard, is, is figuring out like, like what is actually happening? Like, like what are we actually going through? Is it a cultural revolution? Is it a more of a, uh, a color revolution? Um, like, you know, and, and obviously Soros has some part in this, but I, I, I'm struggling to see, I guess, kind of where we are in um, you know, and t- kind of, I guess, kind of what what we're actually going through at the moment. Okay, that that's a very good question, and let me precede it by emphasizing once more, sure, that Soros works for the British. He is a propaganda asset for the British. His purpose is to get up in front of people and say, "Hey, this is a good idea. Let's do this." And whenever he says, let's do this, what he is actually saying is this is what the British power structure, the British establishment wants to do. Mm -hmm. For example, climate change. We think of climate change or we're, we're led to believe that climate change is just something that was invented by liberal do-gooders like Greta Thunberg, who everybody decided to listen to for some reason. But uh, if you you can look this up on the Internet, the the British MI6, which is their foreign intelligence service, actually says, and has, you know, the head of the MI6 actually said in interviews that Pushing climate change and climate change regulation throughout the world is Britain's top priority and therefore MI6's top foreign policy priority. Bar none. I mean, with no exceptions. He said it's the top priority. Imagine that. A country that considers climate change to be its top priority. Imagine such a country. Uh, I feel like Rod Serling 
in the twilight zone. Imagine, if you will, a country whose top priority is to get everybody to go along with climate change ideology and whose whose top intelligence organization, MI6, has declared that it's their top priority too. Mm -hmm. So you will see George Soros pushing climate change. So when he gets up there and says, oh, we have to uh, push climate change, we have to dark, we have to spread white mist in the sky to darken out the sun. He, he has an article on that subject on, on his website. Um, so we all look at him and say, oh, what a crazy guy. Why does he want to dark, uh, you know, block out the sun and make the earth cool? And why does he believe in all this climate change extremism? Hasn't it been discredited? Um, commonsensical people will say. But all he's doing is pushing the official policy of the British government, the British Foreign Office, the British Foreign Intelligence Service. This is what he pushes. And in every mm -hmm. case, I will tell you, it is that's the way it is. You look at the agenda of Soros's Open Society Foundations. You look at the agenda of all his affiliated NGOs. You look at his personal agenda of what he talks about. You look at the agenda of, of um, all his, his Open Society pro uh, uh, projects throughout the world. It is all British policy. It is specifically British policy. There is mm. no country on the face of this earth that has the same policy as George Soros, except the United Kingdom. Every other country, including our own USA, has adopted these policies as a result mm -hmm. of soft power and other forms of influence and pressure, all well, emanating from the UK. You even look at the, the phrase Build Back Better, right? The Build Back Better phrase actually came out of the UK, and then it was actually picked up by the World Economic Forum after that, and it wasn't until much later that, that Biden picked it up, but it was a, it was a Boris Johnson spe uh, idea first. Yes, exactly. And if you look at that stuff closely, it becomes really, really obvious. So the thing that George Soros accomplishes, this is going back to a, an earlier question of yours, you know, what is really his job, I guess, is what you were yeah. asking. I think his job is to take the heat, is to be the bad guy, because the British elites, they know nobody wants all this climate change stuff and digital currency and and COVID gain of function research, all of which emanates originally from the UK and the British establishment, all of which does. And they know they're pushing an unpopular agenda. In fact, they know that they're pushing a horrible agenda that if people knew they were pushing it, they would hate the UK. They, they would despise the UK. They would come to see them as, as a very evil country. And so the way the British manage that, which is very ingenious, they manage it propagandistically by blaming things on other people. The primary, uh, country, the primary group they blame it on is the United States of America. Virtually every unpopular British policy is blamed on the United States and the U.S. government, for reasons still not entirely known, cooperates in this willingly and allows us, innocent Americans, to take the blame for a lot of these things. I think it's part of the special relationship. It's part of the understanding that we will be the bad guys we will be the ones accused of pushing these unwanted agendas on the world. But the other person who is blamed is George Soros, because he gets up there and announces, this is my idea. This is what I think we should do. And then if you criticize him, you won't be accused of being anti-British, even though he's putting forth an, a recognizably and provably British agenda no one will say you're anti-British. Mm -hmm. They won't accuse you of that because nobody cares if you're anti-British. It's permissible. Yeah. They'll say you are anti-Semitic because mm -hmm. you disagree with George Soros and he's Jewish and he's a Holocaust survivor. How well, he dare doesn't you? even practice from what I understand. Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. I, right. Let, let, me, let me tell you, I, I get it. I understand the criticisms that people have. But I, I, you know, my father was a Jew, and he and his whole family did not practice. 
I mean, mm-hmm. so I was, in fact, I, I've written actually, you know, my, my father was Jewish and my mother was actually part Jewish. Um, but I was brought up Catholic because that was my mother's religion. She was, you know, the, the Jewish part of her were conversos from Mexico. It gets complicated. <laughs> but, but um, you know, my father in many ways had a lot of the same attitudes as George Soros. And so um, I, I don't want to get into a contest with Mr. Soros about who's more Jewish than who. He, he wins. Understood. He Understood. wins that one. I, I don't, don't well, want to get I, in that fight. He's more Jewish than I am. Absolutely. Totally. Well, but, I want to I want to point one thing out though that I think is 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 important as well as you mentioned a lot of these things you know coming out of the UK, um, like even a lot of what we're dealing with um, like Russia wise now like if you look at um, like the Steele dossier came out of the UK right it came out of uh, Christopher Steele yes. um, who was a former MI6 agent and that was a lot of where this you know uh, you know since that came out that's where a lot of the the Russia pressure we're seeing now in the US came from is is actually out of that so that I, I guess that's interesting when you look at that as well. Well, well, yes, that's, that's one of the obvious things that's right in our faces. And this is another part of the PSYOP, which is that whenever the British get caught red-handed doing something, they have an automatic cover story, which is that, well, the CIA probably just told them to do it, and they're so terrified of big bad Uncle Sam that they had no choice but to do it. Because otherwise, if they didn't do what we said, what? We're going to nuke them? What are we going to do to them exactly? We're going to do something terrible, supposedly. But this is another PSYOP, like the Soros PSYOP. So the Soros PSYOP says, if George Soros starts pushing some element of British policy, you can't criticize it because it's no longer British policy. It's been laundered through the personality of George Mm. Soros, and it has become the word of George Soros, and if you criticize it, you're an anti-Semite. And so it's kind of like using, it's kind of like being a human shield in a way. He's a human shield for British policy. He's a human shield for British regime change operations, such as color revolutions. He's a human shield for British economic warfare operations, such as crashing currencies, including crashing the British people's own currency, the pound, which Soros absolutely did with the full cooperation of the British establishment. But he stepped forward and voluntarily did this unheard of thing, saying, I did it, I did it. Mm -hmm. And he said that because he has been, a, a, a psychological operation has been set up to protect Soros from criticism. And so if British policy is funneled through Soros, anyone who criticizes it is automatically anti-Semitic. And likewise, the example you gave, Christopher Steele, or let's say the Nord Stream pipeline. Yeah. Now, there's a, there's a strange situation where the Nord Stream pipeline blew up and the Russians immediately said, the UK did it. And... It was like, what? I, I was surprised. The, the Russians don't usually say that. They and then usually, the, the, the U.S. media was like, oh, the Russians did it themselves. It's like, oh, because that makes sense. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but, but the Russians themselves, well, they, they, would, they would say the U.K. did it, and then they'd say the Anglo-Saxons did it. Well, if they wanted to say the Americans did it, they would have said that. But mm-hmm. for some as yet unknown reason... They said the UK did it. Now, there were articles that came out saying that the US and the UK were the only two countries in the world with the technical capability that, that had uh, actual uh, demolition teams capable of doing that kind of deep sea sabotage. And the UK was ex- explicitly named in some of these technical analyses as being the only other country besides the U.S. that could pull off such a thing. So it was interesting that the Brit, that the, I'm sorry, the, the Russians, for whatever reason, unusually decided to single out the U.K. They don't usually do that. Mm-hmm. The Russians usually go along with the idea that the United States is the undisputed hegemon 
of the world and that the UK and every other country in Europe is just their slave and their vassal who does their bidding. That's the Russian position as well as the European and British position. But for some reason with the Nord Stream thing, they said the British did it. So what mm. happened? So Seymour Hirsch comes out with this story on Substack saying, no, no, it was the U.S. and the, Nor and the Norwegians and the Swedes and who, who knows who else, the, the, the Republic of Liechtenstein or the Grand Duchy. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I remember that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I, I, I remember he said the U.S., the Swedes and the Norse. He didn't even mention the allegation that the Russians had made. You would think Mr. Hirsch would at least say, well, the Russians accused the UK, but I looked into it and found that's completely groundless. He mm -hmm. didn't even mention it. He just put out a rival propaganda narrative without comment and without reference to the Russian propaganda narrative, which I found strange. I thought it was very strange. But that's, that's another example. Even if it came out, and some people on Twitter did say this, when the Russians first came out and said, well, the British did it, people were saying, well, if the British did it, it's because the, the Americans made them do it. The Americans told them to do it. Same thing with Christopher Steele. Well, if Christopher Steele was um, spreading false information to influence the U.S. election, it's because the big bad CIA told him to do it. Mm -hmm. So this is another way that the British protect what I call their hidden power the hidden power of Britain. And what it basically comes down to is that our world, as we can plainly see on the most obvious level, is an English-speaking world, mm -hmm. that the English-speaking countries have united together in a very tightly interlocking group which is particularly exemplified by the Five Eyes Intelligence Treaty, where basically our intelligence agencies are, are, have been congealed and locked together, seemingly, uh, to an unprecedented extent, to, to an extent that calls into question whether we, we, we are even sovereign nations anymore. Right. And I will also say that Henry Kissinger himself in a speech in 1982 before uh, the, the British think tank Chatham House, he said that after World War II, that a relationship that during and after World War II, he said it started during World War II, supposedly. I think it started earlier. But he said, especially during the World War II, a relationship was set up between the U.S. and the U.K., the special relationship, under which he said that the, that the British government had, had more um, input and authority over U.S. affairs, including internal affairs, Kissinger said, than, in his opinion, had ever happened between two sovereign nations. Wow. That's what he said. Mm-hmm. And he said this in a speech before Chatham House in 1982. Now, they have what they call Chatham House rules. All these types of discussions are supposed to be secret. So I imagine that was probably secret for a number of years and then maybe was released more recently. I'm not sure when it was released, but it was an extraordinary statement, especially coming from Kissinger. And he added in this speech that during his years in, his, in the White House, said Kissinger, that he was more open with the British Foreign Office than he was with his own U.S. State Department, that mm -hmm. he worked more closely with the British Foreign Office than he did with the U.S. State Department. Well, looked at from a counterintelligence point of view, um, you, you could take that as a confession that he was actually he, he was that, that that he was actually a British agent of influence. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he's the the uh, national security advisor, I think he was first, and then he was promoted to Secretary of State, and he's keeping the British Foreign Office better informed than his own Secretary of State. I, I get double agent vibes from that. 
I yeah. mean, I think people can get in big trouble for doing that, but because he's Henry Kissinger, he can say it in his speech and everybody applauds and says, how wonderful. But uh, I think if you or I tried that, um, you know, <laughs> we might, might be a little trouble. <laughs> I think so. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, maybe, well, Richard, um, I, I, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think we got really, really deep into things here, too. So I'm, I think we'll definitely have to have you back in the future to kind of dive a little bit more into this. But for people listening, if they want to, you know, connect with you, follow more of what you're doing and also, you know, check out more of what you're writing, where's the best place for our listeners to go? I have a website, richardpoe.com. Um, I write on Substack. That's probably the best place to go. We all want to support Substack. And I'm on Twitter at realrichardpoe.com. Very cool. Richard Poe, thank you so much for your time today, sir. Thank you, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>